Chapter 5 of The Altar of the Dead by Henry James. They fell at last into the way of walking together almost every time they met, though for a long time still they never met but at church. He couldn't ask her to come and see him, and as if she hadn't a proper place to receive him, she never invited her friend. As much as himself, she knew the world of London, but from an undiscussed instinct of privacy, they haunted the region not mapped on the social chart. On the return, she always made him leave her at the same corner. She looked with him, as a pretext for a pause, at the depressed things in suburban shop fronts, and there was never a word he had said to her, that she hadn't beautifully understood. For long ages he never knew her name, any more than she had ever pronounced his own. But it was not their names that mattered. It was only their perfect practice and their common need. These things made their whole relation so impersonal that they hadn't the rules or reasons people found in ordinary friendships. They didn't care for the things it was supposed necessary to care for in the intercourse of the world. They ended one day, they never knew which of them expressed it first, by throwing out the idea that they did care for each other. Over this idea, they grew quite intimate. They rallied to it in a way that marked a fresh start in their confidence. If to feel deeply together about certain things wholly distinct from themselves didn't constitute a safety, where was safety to be looked for? Not likely, nor often, not without occasion, nor without emotion, any more than in any other reference by serious people to a mystery of their faith. But when something had happened to warm, as it were, the air for it, they came as near as they could come to calling their dead by name. They felt it was coming very near to utter their thought at all. The word they expressed enough. It limited the mention. It had a dignity of its own, and if, in their talk, you had heard our friends use it, you might have taken them for a pair of pagans of old, alluding decently to the domesticated gods. They never knew, at least Stransom never knew, how they had learned to be sure about each other. If it had been with each a question of what the other was there for, the certitude had come in some fine way of its own. Any faith, after all, has the instinct of propagation, and it was as natural as it was beautiful that they should have taken pleasure on the spot in the imagination of a following. If the following was for each but a following of one, it had proved in the event sufficient. Her debt, however, of course which much greater than his, because while she had only given him a worshipper, he had given her a splendid temple. Once she said she pitied him for the length of his list. She had counted his candles almost as often as himself, and this made him wonder what could have been the length of hers. He had wondered before at the coincidence of their losses, especially as from time to time a new candle was set up. On some occasion, some accident led him to express this curiosity. And she answered, as if in surprise, that he hadn't already understood. Oh, for me, you know, the more there are, the better. There could never be too many. I should like hundreds and hundreds. I should like thousands. I should like a great mountain of light. Then, of course, in a flash, he understood. Your dead are only one? She hung back at this as never yet. Only one, she answered, coloring as if now he knew her guarded secret. It really made him feel he knew less than before. So difficult was it for him to reconstitute a life in which a single experience had so belittled all others. His own life, round its central hollow, had been packed close enough. After this, she appeared to have regretted her confession, though at the moment she spoke, there had been pride in her very embarrassment. She declared to him 
that his own was the larger, the dearer possession, the portion one would have chosen if one had been able to choose. She assured him she could perfectly imagine some of the echoes with which his silences were peopled. He knew she couldn't. One's relation to what one had loved and hated had been a relation too distinct from the relations of others. But this didn't affect the fact that they were growing old together in their piety. She was a feature of that piety, but even at the ripe stage of acquaintance in which they occasionally arranged to meet at a concert or to go together to an exhibition, she was not a feature of anything else. The most that happened was that his worship became paramount. Friend by friend dropped away, till at last there were more emblems on his altar than houses left him to enter. She was more than any other the friend who remained, but she was unknown to all the rest. Once, when she had discovered, as they called it, a new star, she used the expression that the chapel at last was full. Oh, no, Stransom replied. There is a great thing wanting for that. The chapel will never be full till a candle is set up before which all the others would pale. It will be the tallest candle of all. Her mild wonder rested on him. What candle do you mean? I mean, dear lady, my own. He had learned after a long time that she earned her money by her pen, writing under a pseudonym she never disclosed in magazines he never saw. She knew too well what he couldn't read and what she couldn't write, and she taught him to cultivate indifference with a success that did much for their good relations. Her invisible industry was a convenience to him. It helped his contented thought of her, the thought that rested in the dignity of her proud, obscure life, her little remunerated art, and her little impenetrable home. Lost with her decayed relative in her dim suburban world, she came to the surface for him in distant places. She was really the priestess of his altar, and whenever he quitted England, he committed it to her keeping. She proved to him afresh that women have more of the spirit of religion than men. He felt his fidelity pale and faint in comparison with hers. He often said to her that since he had so little time to live, he rejoiced in her having so much. So glad was he to think she would guard the temple when he should have been called. He had a great plan for that, which of course he told her too a bequest of money to keep it up in undiminished state. Of the administration of this fund, he would appoint her superintendent, and if the spirit should move her, she might kindle a taper even for him. And who will kindle one even for me? she then seriously asked. End of chapter 5